That was great, Unley. I was having flashbacks myself. I was tripping there for a while. Wow, that was wonderful. Just trying to capture the spirit of it. That man. is the spirit, my friend. Holy cow. Wow. <laughs> All right, everybody. We are also on Utreon. I dropped a link inside of the chat again, and there's a link in the description if you want to follow us there. And if you do donate chats there, it's actually only 20%, so we'll get wow. more of it, too. Oh, wow. But... We're trying to hide who the story is and what it's all about. So now we've got to get a little background. So tell well, us. I, yeah, Mark. I just wanted to say, like, you know, you got to trust us on these stories because I don't want to give them away in general in the thumbnail. But a lot of people who have bought into the channel, once they watch the story, they're, they're amazed by it. But I, I can't tell the story if I give the entire thing away up front. And but it's also difficult to attract people from the outside world. I mean, if that makes any sense. Oh, yeah. <laughs> As Eric has pointed out. But to our loyal viewers who know this must be something of a weird story or we wouldn't be doing it, I tip my hat to them uh, for coming by this afternoon. This is a unusual rock and roll story. All right. And it starts with a couple um, Yiddish folks in New York, right? Well, it's actually three Jewish guys, two of them from Brooklyn, uh, one of them from a place called the Bronx, which when we were growing up was a foreign country. It was considered so far away that we thought it was near the North Pole. No one had ever been. <laughs> no, I'm serious, because we were like from South Brooklyn and Coney Island. It was far. It was further than going to Manhattan. It was another world up there. No one really knew what happened up there and nobody really cared, but we knew the Yankees were up there and we hated them. So nobody was ever going to go to the Bronx unless the Dodgers were playing uh, the Yankees up there. But anyway, so two of these guys, uh, uh, Goldstein and his partner uh, are from Brooklyn Feldman, Jerry Goldstein and Bob Feldman and Richard Goderer is the guy from the Bronx. And the three of them are fledgling. Hey, thank you. Merry Taylor. Christmas. Thank you, Telex. Um, three of them are fledgling Brill building songwriters. And I need to explain what Brill building songwriters are. Is that near Tin Pan Alley or am I way off? No, Tin Pan Alley was in the 1920s, 1910s. And Tin Pan Alley okay. was a series of brownstones on 29th Street in Manhattan, which had music publishing. Same idea but a different era of ragtime and different types of music going back uh, to the 1920s. I mean, Tin Pan Alley goes back to 1885, actually, in New York on 29th Street in those brownstones. The Brill Building, which is on 49th and Broadway, was uh, named after a haberdasher named Brill, who was downstairs, but that has nothing to do with it. It's an Art Deco building that was filled with pop songwriters like Carol King and Neil Sedaka, and Paul Simon under a pseudonym. Uh, all of these guys, um, Bobby Lou Reed? Aaron, Lou, excuse me? Lou Reed wrote there too, right? Or is no, it some no, else? This is way, this is early before Lou Reed. Lieber oh. and Stola were in there writing for Elvis in the late 50s. This is early, late 50s, early 60s, Eric. Okay. So you had Laura Nero in there, a guy who would become Tony Orlando <laughs> later on. Um, and they were all pitching songs two different musicians who were coming in and out of the building 24 7. so this was a period of the girl groups so you're talking about 1963 before the kennedy assassination before the beatles before yesterday and the beatles when a man could still work and still could as merle haggard said <laughs> in are the good times really over but that was the period of the spring and 63 and 62. so goldstein and feldman and Goddard were trying to become songwriters and were not having a good time of it. They were broke. Uh, Goddard was actually in law school at NYU and never attended class. His grandmother was paying for it. And at one point, the dean called up looking for him. And uh, the grandmother was wondering where he went, where he was and everything else. But he was in the Brill Building, 
trying to come up with these songs and pitch them to managers and to pitch them to talent, which is what they did. Anyway, so he ends up in a coffee shop in Brooklyn, Sid's Luncheonette on Plum First Street, I would hope, which was the one I used to go to. I doubt if it was that one, but that was the one I used to go to. And he was having an egg cream, which is a strange urban concoction of chocolate syrup, a small layer of milk, and then seltzer hit hard from the outside world into the glass, tilted at an angle to make the foam rise to where it was a white head of foam. And I'm getting into this for a reason, because it's an art form. The perfect egg cream is an art form. And I'm waiting for the egg. <laughs> there's no egg. There's no okay, egg so it's egg. like Velveeta, which has no cheese. Has Got no it. cheese, has no egg. In the 70s, when I worked for my uncle uh, Louis on 42nd Street in his coffee shop, Shelley's, I got into making egg creams for people, especially my friends who would come down late at night and be stoned. And then I'd make egg creams. My uncle's already back home in Brooklyn. And I had this place to myself in Manhattan on 42nd Street, which was completely insane. And we'll get into that in another episode uh, of giving this 18 year old kid a coffee shop in Manhattan on 42nd Street in the 70s. Hijinks ensued, let me just tell you that. <laughs> anyway, so I'm trying to master this egg cream. And eventually the Daily News came in and wrote an article about me making the perfect egg cream. So that's why I elaborated a little bit on it. And Goldstein talks about um, having an egg cream in this luncheonette around Coney Island uh, in Brooklyn. So it's 1962, 63, right? And he's sitting there totally depressed. He has no career. They're on the balls of their ass. Nothing's ever come to fruition. They had one minor uh, song that charted at number 32 called Love, Love or something. And he hears an argument in back of him of these two girls and the girl is screaming at this other guy saying my boyfriend has come back from new jersey he's going to kick your ass you're a liar you never did any of that that stuff and you're full of it and he starts to furiously write down the conversation on a napkin while he's sitting at the counter at the luncheonette and he writes down these all these lyrics of this girl screaming and he gets in the car and he drives or he got into a cab that's right he didn't take the train he was in such a hurry he got a cab went into manhattan called up the other two guys and yelled i think we have a number one hit and the two guys rushed to the brill building where they had a piano and and other recording stuff and they sat down and he started to tell them the lyrics and Goderer goes over to the piano and starts tinkering on the piano. And over a period of a couple of hours, they came up with a song that became a number one hit and put them on the map by the angels. Now it's called My Boyfriend's. OK, so <laughs> those are the actual lyrics that he wrote down in the coffee shop. And those are the angels, three girls from Jersey, who they dated and became their girlfriends. Oh. And yeah, and they later broke up when they became famous, but yeah, well. more famous. But the angels were their girlfriends. So they call the girls into the real building and they get them to rehearse and they cut the record and it goes to number one on the charts. And they can't believe their luck. They're rolling in dough. They buy cars. They're living large. And all of a sudden in 1964, later that next year, a group shows up from England called the Beatles and it's all <laughs> there's no more girl groups it's the end kaput and they can't get arrested they're trying to write a million variations of girl group stuff Dave Clark Five shows up the animals with Eric Burden um, all these girl groups go out the window and that's the end for them and now they're back to depression city <laughs> and they can't get arrested and they don't know what to do they they you know can't come up with a theme they Goddard is going to have to go back to law school and they're laying around one day and they need to come up with an idea for a band and for, for, for a show. And this is them. Yeah, this is, um, uh, that's Feldman in the middle. I think it's, uh, Goldstein on the right and, um, uh, Goddard on the left. Um, yeah, Feldman's in the middle right there. Anyway, so they're kicking this around and, they come up, they listen to a certain amount of music, and they come up with a song that's based on a book by Terry Southern called I Want Candy. And that candy is the name of the book that's shown here, right? The Terry Southern novel. 
And that movie was almost uh, considered pornographic at the time because it was this stunning blonde who everyone in the movie was right at the beginning of the counterculture. And Terry Southern would go on to write Easy, uh, Easy Rider. And he would also go on to write uh, Dr. Strangelove with Stanley Kubrick. So they're laying around and this novel was the hottest thing that summer. And they, you know, the guy started saying, I want candy. I want candy. And repeatedly saying, I want candy. The girl who's in the, 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 <laughs> the novel. And that became a movie called Candy um, about them chasing this girl around, the hottest girl in, in California around the beaches and everything. And she was based on a real uh, uh, beach bimbo bikini blonde who was from Hermosa Beach, I believe. Uh, who recently passed away a couple of years ago, like the age of 90 or something. But the reality of it is uh, Terry Southern goes on to write Dr. Strangelove and they open up the newspaper to see what was in the movies. And there's a full page ad in the Daily News for Dr. Strangelove. So Goldstein says, that's the name of our band. And he goes, what? And he says, the doctors? <laughs> he says, no, <laughs> the strange loves. And the guy said, all right, well, that makes some sense, I guess. We're the strange loves, you know. So they go into the studio and they record I Want Candy to this Bo Diddley backbeat. And it just, again, takes off and goes crazy, the song. And that's kind of what puts them back into the game as I Want Candy, which is uh, a huge hit at the time. All right. Uh, do we want to cue that one up? If you can, just a little bit of it, give a, a sense of what I Want Candy was about. Um, oh, maybe not. Maybe we should wait, Eric. Yeah, I thought you just, had, just wait. Okay, there are elements gonna, of it that you right, want to Let me to explain share. this a little further because I Want Candy uh, becomes a hit. And these guys look exactly like Eric showed in that picture in the studio. So, the backstory that they put out is for the band, complete insane bio, that there are three sheep herders from Australia named Niles, Miles, and Giles Strange. And they're three brothers shown here, <laughs> shown here with their African drums and their spears. And the brothers came up with a new type of sheep a uh, breeding sheep called the Goddara sheep, which is, of course, the last name of Richard Goddara. And they said that the breeding of that sheep in Australia made them millions and millions of dollars, and they were able to focus on becoming a rock band and coming to America to tour. And their, uh, one, their lead song is I Want Candy. <laughs> so this entire fictitious thing helps repel the record and they put out an album it's got nighttime on it that original song you played at the intro it's got another song called carolyn and uh, a bunch of other songs on there i think it had a cover of some uh, of another oh it had a cover of satisfaction actually by the stones uh, which is kind of weird uh, so this is 1965 and they're kind of you know making money off of 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 i want candy and they get a call from a dj in virginia beach and the DJ says, we've got a concert down here um, and we'd like you to play the concert. And the concert features Chuck Berry, the Shangri-Las, and hopefully them. So they are completely petrified. They've never played in public. The Strange Loves is a made up band. They don't exist. No one knows that they made this whole cock and bull story up. They're not from Australia. They said they're from Armstrong, Australia, which is another made up uh, town. And th they said, if we couldn't do British accents, maybe we could do Australian accents because nobody knew anybody <laughs> from Australia. <laughs> so they said, nobody's going to believe our accents. But if we try to put on British accents with the British invasion and so many Brits running around in the media, we're going to be outed. So here is a promotion shot of them in their zebra breast uh, uh, vests, <laughs> leather pants. More Africa than Australia. <laughs> right, right, right. They, and they had spears and, and drums and some keyboards making absolutely no cultural sense. It's not even cultural appropriation. It's like cultural misappropriation, I think, because it makes <laughs> absolutely no sense. And one reporter says to them, you know, you guys don't even look alike. And, and Goldstein says, our mother spent a lot of time in the bush. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> no <laughs> pun in that. <laughs> Just a crazy answer. And they, because they don't even look alike. And they're Miles, Niles, and Giles Strange. And <laughs> anyway, the story just gets crazier, Eric. They get invited by the DJ through their management. And they drive from Brooklyn all the way to Newport News, Virginia, the airport right here. Uh, th well, this is probably cleaned up a little bit now. But yeah, this airport, <laughs> they drive to this airport. Just and up back, the road from me. <laughs> right up the road from you, right? Yeah. yeah. That's great. So in back of the airport, they have waiting for them a private jet and they get on the private jet and there's nowhere to fly. The gigs in Virginia Beach uh, near the water, which is what, like 40 miles, Eric, or? Yeah, a good, yeah, good 40. Right. OK, yeah. so they change into <laughs> they change into their outfits on the plane, putting on those zebra vests and the spears and the whole thing on the plane. The plane doesn't even take off or land. It's towed around from another runway in back of the terminal to the front of the terminal where there's 5,000 screaming girls yelling, we welcome, welcome to America, the strange loves. And they're going crazy. And it looks like help, like out of the Beatles or something. And they're... <laughs> Which is even more insane, Mark, because I was just telling you before we went on, at that time, that airport was like in the middle of freaking nowhere. It, you would have crossed like 20 miles of farmland. Right. Okay. So <laughs> they've got banners. Worldwide. They've got uh, media there from Virginia and Philly. And they're taken in a motorcade surrounded by the media with motorcycles in limousines to the concert 40 miles away in Virginia Beach. <laughs> and they're scared to death. And they open for... They meet Chuck Berry. They meet the Shangri-Las. Nobody knows what to make of these guys. They're trying not to speak to anybody and <laughs> they give away their accents. And they, they open up with a 20-minute rendition of Shout going absolutely crazy, rocks the audience. They're banging on their African drums, singing. They picked up a three-piece a, a bass, guitar, and drum high school band to back them up who are from down there just as a backup band in back of them. So the, <laughs> the band, which happens a lot. I mean, Chuck Berry used to do that a lot. Sure. And a lot of artists just traveled alone and then picked up a band wherever they went to, paid them a hundred bucks and that was the end of it. Anyway, so these three kids are backing them up and they're doing shout. They go into um, I Want Candy. The place goes crazy because it, it's charting as a big hit. And that's what really what they want to hear. And they had these other songs that they played also, you know, My Boyfriend's Back, they did a cover of that. And, you know, they played for like 40 minutes. And this becomes a revelation to them. And that leads to bigger and better things. They go on tour and they open up for the Beach Boys and they start touring with the Beach Boys. And at one particular gig in, in, in Cincinnati or Pittsburgh, uh, Dennis Wilson falls off the stage and knocks himself out unconscious. And Jerry Goldstein jumps in on drums and plays the rest of the Beach Boys set as oh, Dennis wow. Wilson, which is, that's pretty interesting. That's <laughs> yeah, pretty no interesting. kidding. They're in Pittsburgh for a gig and uh, there's a TV crew and he's handling a boomerang, uh, Jerry. He's playing around with it. And one of, the, one of the TV crewmen comes up to him and says, excuse me, Mr. Strange, he calls him Mr. Strange because what else are you going to call him? He says, <laughs> that's his last Mr. name. Strange. He <laughs> says, I don't think that's the proper way to handle a boomerang. And he says, oh, what do you know, mate? I'm the world's champion. <laughs> so he takes it and he chucks it and he hits the cameraman in the head 100 yards down, giving him 22 stitches in the head. And he says, that's how you toss a boomerang, mate. <laughs> that happened in Pittsburgh uh, while they were on tour. So, I mean, <laughs> just some great, great stories of this phony rock band, which is not a phony rock band. You know, it's it's a real rock band, but they're just a phony name and a phony backstory, mm. which leads us to them Hullabaloo. getting booked on Hullabaloo. And that is on national television. Uh, I'm going to have to break this down for some people because this is a fascinating piece of pop video. Go ahead. All right. So tell hey. me at points to stop. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll maybe play it and then we'll, we'll stop. Go ahead. Sweet. 
Now, isn't that somebody significant? I okay, yeah. If you could just go back to the top where you started, I want I could just show you a little bit. Just go back to the beginning. There you go. Right over there. Just kick it. Go ahead. Start it up right there. At the bottom of your screen, you're going to see a guy enter. His name is Sammy Davis Jr. Right there, my friend. That's, that's, that's him strutting in? That's Sammy Davis Jr. trotting in who had introduced them. And now if you ah. go back to where you were, that was Sammy. Sammy's going to sit on the right at a table. Um, All right. This guy on the left over here oh, in the oh that this guy, guy on the right left here with the girl is Sonny Bono and Cher are sitting there uh, watching and taking this in. Who would later tour with them? So that's <laughs> of interest. Very cool. Just play a little bit more. There's there's Sammy dancing right there, doing the Holly Gully. By the way, that's called the Holly hmm. Gully. That dance. Okay. <laughs> You All see right. the back of Cher right there. That's that Cher's hair right there. Right here? Yeah, and in uh -huh. front of her is Sonny wearing that striped shirt. That With this crazy horn. Or, no, that's a drum in the background. Okay, never mind. Right. In back <laughs> of them are the three. Um, the strange loves are here. Yeah. The strange loves are right there. But in back of them are the three kids who are back in them. Actually, at this point, it's not three kids. It's three studio musicians they brought with them um, from New York to actually back them up, who would later become the road company of the strange loves and will tour as the strange loves looking like completely clean cut strange loves later because all they want to do is get back in the studio and make uh, music again all right well crazy just play it a little bit more yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. so somebody in the chat saying this is a whiskey go go. And uh, the show is Hullabaloo. Whiskey go go is not a show. The show is called Hullabaloo. Okay. The, uh, is that the whiskey go go is a place. Right. Okay. Right. This is a show called Hullabaloo. Anyway, um, this really propels them into another level of success, but it allows them to select, like Blue Man Group did, like we discussed, a road company version of themselves to tour. But they end up. Um, on a night in Ohio on this tour um, that we're watching. And they're supposed to play in some rundown gymnasium. And in the gymnasium, uh, the gig gets canceled, but they, they meet a guy who has a band who is in the same bill with them called Rick and the Raiders. And Rick and the Raiders is from Ohio. And Rick is a guy named Rick Derringer. And they have a song that they take back they take him into New York, Rick Derringer, and they re-record a song that's on their album that they actually wrote and produced for their first album. That song goes absolutely batshit crazy on the charts. And I don't know if we have a cut of that. But we do. I'm working on it right now. Okay, because that song, which they take the presence of mind to use Rick Derringer uh, to re-record. This is really the original. Is this is the McCoys, yeah. But then you were talking about the remake. Oh, the remix. And yeah, with Rick Derringer. Yeah, the remix is unbelievable. This is another band they made up called the McCoys. But take a look at this. That's Rick Derringer. This woman is Rick Derringer. This woman becomes his wife. Uh, it's one of the great rock videos and one of the first rock videos of all time with the McCoys playing Hang On Sloopy. This is a remix of, of the song, but um, this is also uh, produced by the Strangelove guys and, and written by them. So this is what they want to do in the Brill Building. This is the kind of work that they want to do. And they begin to do this, you know, this type of stuff um, as writer producers. And all of these different people end up, you know, uh, playing their music over the years. I mean, it becomes like, 
uh, David Bowie records one of their songs and, and, you know, Bow, all wow, these, wow. <laughs> Bow, wow, wow. And Jay Giles band and Aaron Carter and George Thorogood and Bauhaus of all people who, who would have thought Bauhaus? Wait, Bauhaus. What, I which, swear to God. which track, which track? I don't Come know. On. I don't know. I'm gonna have to I got to find that one. Cause I'm <laughs> a big Bauhaus fan. <laughs> it says Bauhaus recorded their stuff. Ooh, but, okay. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. So we had, um, an attempt by uh, Ed Sullivan tries to book him on the show and Goddard says, I can't do it. And they said, why not? He says, because my grandmother thinks she's in, I'm in law school. <laughs> and if she sees me on the Ed Sullivan show, I'm finished. So they turned down Ed Sullivan, who keeps raising the price from 5000 to 10000 to $15,000 for them to come on the Ed Sullivan show. And they turn him down because Goddard refuses. He doesn't want his grandmother in the Bronx to see him uh, on TV. Wow. That is crazy. All right. So where did they go from there? They produced a ton of artists, right? Or at least one of them did. Well, I mean, they get they get rich off of this. They um, the thing that goes on Bang Records. Um, the, the Derringer thing goes crazy. I mean, Godera ends up. Um, they don't go separate ways, but they do create different labels and create different sounds. Goderer ends up producing Blondie, The Go-Go's, Marshall Crenshaw, uh, Jerry Goldstein, who was probably the most creative of the group, ends up producing an obscure, they felt that that um, that the song uh, was kind of a proto-punk song, I Want Candy, because it gets covered by a lot of weird mm. bands. And oddly enough, Goldstein ends up producing um, a band called War and produces Spill the Wine and Low really? Rider. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He Eric Burton. All, what's that? Eric Burton. Yeah. Yeah. He produces all the war songs. Cisco Kid. Um, he oh. also produces a band called the Circle Jerks, Eric. <laughs> well, they go well together, War and Circle Jerks. <laughs> I don't know what the connection is, except that, uh, you know, Marshall Crenshaw is one of them. And um, I mean, just really obscure weird acts, you know, that these guys got into. Um, and they, you know, they had some reunions every once in a while, but <laughs> yeah, I guess this must be pretty recent <laughs> because uh, one of them's about 80 years old and I, and he's going to be doing a meet and greet down in Miami January uh, next month. Um, one of them, Goldstein, I think, uh, Feldman, I'm sorry, I take that back, Feldman. Now, Feldman got married and also had some children. And um, some of the audience might know who his son is. Corey Feldman becomes the child, becomes a child, <laughs> is the child of Bob Feldman, the guy you just saw from The Strange Loves. One of the craziest pieces of uh, Hollywood pop culture I've ever stumbled into. <laughs> well, he likes his outfits too. Come on. It fits. <laughs> yeah, the apple doesn't fall that far from the tree, or in this case, the knish doesn't fall that far from the tree. But uh, yeah, what a strange rock and roll story. I mean, I, I, sometime when I when I get home, I'm going to find the audio tape because I interviewed them. Uh, they live in Beverly Hills, or one or two of them lived in Beverly Hills at the time, about five or ten years ago. And I did an audio taped interview where I'm, a lot of this story is coming from that I'm telling you today. So maybe and where are we going to put that uh, audio when you get it? Well, we could put it on locals and let yeah, people. Yeah, I think we might do that. That'd we could put it on cool. locals and um, let people listen to it on locals. Um, I have to find it, but the the Tin Pan Alley begat the Brill Building, which begat nothing because it went you know kaput after a while. But yeah, it went to Sweden. It, it went to Abba. It, it yeah. went to Abba. Okay, it did. I mean, the, the yeah, big, maybe right. I just went to maybe Sweden right. and then kind of came back here. Um, that's where I got confused on the timelines. I just read a book on, on that. And we had a major, we still have a Swedish invasion. Um, yes, that is for true. Pop. That is true for pop. Yeah. What happened to the girl who was the, uh, who was the swan? Um, I forget her name. She won the war. That's white swan outfit. Who was, um, the first big star to come out of Sweden. Um, uh, I'm not sure. I Not forgot sure. her, her name already. After ABBA came out, um, she was almost avant-garde. Okay, yeah. I, 
But I mean, they've got a heavy death metal scene there and all kinds of crazy stuff. And, and yeah, they do. So fight. Sweden and Norway have a, a nice competition. Norway, they all killed each other, though. So I'm going to say Sweden's ahead. Oh, they actually death metal killed them. No, black metal. No, no, they're black really metal. there is he's out. And I don't know if he went back in, but he killed two people. I, oh, I, no. I'm not kidding. <laughs> that uh, we can't uh, go into that because um, it's not America. Right. But it's not, it's not it America. Is, it, it is a psycho, Swedish untold story. story. It's a Scandinavian yeah, untold story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Our future no, sister no. channel when we hook up with <laughs> the all-girl Swedish group that we're going to find and bring them in to tell us the great untold Swedish stories on our international Swedish channel. Exactly. Exactly. Which may, right. may not happen. We have ambition. But we're going to grow. Yeah, we're, yeah, we have ambition to grow. We're not as small <laughs> as, as you think. We have tentacles that are reaching out into many worlds. Exactly. But, uh, yeah, I mean, this is a holiday story. There's nothing violent. There's no conspiracy here. There's no cell phone. There's no shooting. It's just a good, unusual American uh, success story of three guys who busted their butts and worked really hard to get where they were. And they're their biggest fear that would is that they would become one hit wonders. And when uh, Feldman was in Brooklyn, he was in a bar or something and somebody introduced him and they said, ah, there's, there's just a one hit wonder and it pissed him off. And they were obsessed about not being one hit wonders. And that's why they work so hard to make those other albums and those other songs and produce all this other talent. And they, you know, made a little mini empire for themselves. They uh, signed with Atlantic and uh, Ahmed Erdogan. Um, Dots and tentacles, yeah. That's They're right. together. The tickles somehow. And we'll ride over out. on a bottle. <laughs> right. There'll be a <laughs> bottle with tentacles around it floating to the shore in Virginia Beach, which will be picked up by um, Chuck Berry at some point. But yeah, the girl groups ended. Rock and roll, uh, you know, was British invaded, and uh, and in a weird way, there was an Australian in invasion, and that was the Bee Gees, and they exploded. You know, ten years later, it they took over to right after that. Right, but I'm saying the, the when yeah. when when the late seventies when disco happened, the, the, the amount of songs on the hit parade that the Bee Gees had, they had, at some point one point they had the top four songs on the, of the top hundred songs in a row. I mean, there's oh, yeah. a great documentary on HBO about the Bee Gees that I strongly recommend. It's just a fascinating time capsule into a you know a group that came from Australia. Um, oh, I agree who really did come from Australia, who did not play in an Aboriginal band, but um, were a family band, you know. Yeah, definitely. And uh, <clears throat> a lot of parallels. It, they, they suffered greatly, though, at the end, um, being completely tied in with disco, which was not fair right. at all, but it didn't matter. It was like somehow those two just got combined and they went up as high as you could and down just as um, precipitously. I think it well, was Ohio. again, it, just great songwriting. I don't, you know, sure. despite what happened with Donna Summer and Disco and Stein and, you know, whatever happened to remember they were burning r r Disco oh, yeah. in, in Cleveland, oh, yeah. right, Eric? Or Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I think it was, well, I said Ohio. I think it was Cleveland. I don't know where, but Cleveland they had a stadium, stadium where everybody right? brought in yeah, their they had albums. Yeah, Disco um, <laughs> radio just, uh, promotion. It, where they, it got out of hand. And they almost burned the stadium to the ground. If you ever see the footage of that, it's a near riot breaks mm -hmm. out and fires and fights. And, and they brought the records and they burned those too. And that was the end of disco. And I guess the beginning of a new, a new sound that was at the end, that was like 79 or something. Yeah. Right around that. I mean, they, I was going to say the ascent of the sex pistols right at that time, but then they went down too. And you were, we went from poke to, um, punk to post-punk, like, almost instantly if you right. look at you know sex pistols to joy division to new order right and down the well, that's line that's like 80 81 is there or 79? right but that's yeah i mean but the police were 79 and that was a different genre so you already could see the big shift that was happening mm -hmm. the cars came out or about then um acdc i'm still going to bring up for the other aussie band because they came out in like 77 78 and then right. got bigger 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 until i think they have the second biggest album of all time which wow. is remarkable. Wow. Back in Black, it's ahead of um, Pink oh, Floyd. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So it's like right behind Thriller. It's it's 
I mean, one what, of those, year, what year is the first Clash album? 78? Uh, 70, 79, the double album comes out in 79, 80? I, it could have been 76 or 7 for um, Combat Rock. And then Combat uh, Rock London Calling. That early? Out, in the London Calling, I want to say 79. Right. Okay, London Calling. Is and then they, um, they split off to uh, Big Audio Dynamite which branched off in like 82 or three. I mean, really a very tight period. A lot happened. A lot happened very quickly. So and then the just, Sex Pistols tour of the United States, right? Uh, Yeah. Well, and that's, I don't know. If Sid now died Johnny there. Rotten lives in Venice and he's beating homeless people to get them off his lawn. He's, oh, and he's, 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 he's pretty lost much his a, mind. He's, he's pretty much a, a MAGA Trumper. Oh, guy. yeah. <laughs> he bought a house and it's been overrun. Oh. By okay, maybe it. Combat Rock was later. Then. I don't know. Yeah, I figure it's got to be a little bit later. Yeah. Okay, so uh, London Calling was before Combat Rock. London Calling at 79, right? 78. Yeah. So okay. what was their album, their first album? Was it uh, Sandinista? Or, no, I, Sandinista I came after that. I'd have to look. Because I don't think London Calling was their debut. I don't think they gave them a double album to start. Uh, I'm trying to remember. Um, <laughs> anyway, but Rotten has been beating the homeless on his front lawn for the past three years. <laughs> And they're defecating and urinating, and he can't even walk out of his house. The poor guy. Well, think about think about his range. He's gone from being destitute, damn near homeless himself, to mm -hmm. beating. It's just you know, it's a full yeah, circle a, of life. A full circle, <laughs> I, a circle jerk almost, Eric. You know. And, <laughs> there we go. We're coming back to it. And a oh, while we're stroking, like <laughs> monster. I mean, there's there's obscure L.A. bands that you know people swear of the Beatles of of punk. You know uh john just like a contradiction yeah of terms <laughs> but, I mean, it's like the the punk movement was the anti-beatles right the, we're, the so <laughs> we're the rolling stones of classical music yeah there you go all right so what is next for us okay so we're gonna do america's street games and this is the history of um street games that came to America in the 1800s from Europe and were played in every city in the country, basically. Uh, they have died down quite a bit, but they're still played even in, in, like I said to you, I was in New York a couple of years ago and on the Upper West Side, kids were still playing Skelly on the streets with chalk. And there's a lot of games we're going to get into. Ring Olivio, Johnny on the Pony, Red Light, Green Light, Box Ball, Slap Ball, Stick Ball. Um, there's a whole slew of these games that kids have been playing for over 200 years. And I'm going to try to explain the connection between the industrial revolution and children's street games. And you will be, that'll be a Christmas children's special. We're going to have that, I guess. And on Friday, what are we doing on Friday? Is that Christmas we, or we may or may not do Baldwin depending on what's happening? We've got a little stuff. We'll see what's going together. May do a partial Baldwin and partial Q and A about Baldwin. Just okay. who's got questions. But um, for everybody who's interested, good time to join locals. We're going to do a Q and A on locals. Really, Mark and I tomorrow night, nine p.m. Eastern. What do you wear to a Q and A? You could just come as is, right? You don't have to get dressed up for a Q and A. Yeah, we're not going to do the hot tub version. Okay. All right. We're we're too far apart. Otherwise, we we might consider it. Right. Not. Right. <laughs> not ever. By the way, just to let everybody know. So that not, they can ask any question at all. There's no limitation to the question. Right. We there may be a limitation to what we actually answer, but we. Right. We Remember that George Carlin don't. bit, Eric? We're in Catholic school. He said, "Can God make a rock so big even he can't lift it?" And the nuns would beat him. <laughs> <laughs> when he'd come up with these obscure philosophical questions, and that was one from an album. There had to but, be one who had a sense of humor about it. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. And you may even, depending on if we have time or not, you might even have a, a story out of your life um, to share. Oh, right. We could folks. throw in a quick one. Yeah, we could, could throw in a quick one. Um, yeah, be literally um, exclusive. Short story. Like there's short stories, you know, just like Aesop's Fables. Yeah, yeah. So something about just a little bit of a teaser may tell the story of how this happened. If we have time, yeah, that's a fascinating story. Wow, holy cow! Yeah, that and that that was in the National Archives. 
<laughs> that was released with some of the Oswald stuff from the other day. And by the way, I'm still going through the Oswald stuff. I'm going to post it on Locals with some miniature analysis of documents I'm cherry picking um, that are important. A lot of them are just bullshit, but there are some that have some uh, resonance. And as I said, I, I, I think they left Mexico City for last. And it's not because they're afraid of offending Mexico City. There's a reason that all the stuff from Mexico City has been left at the bottom of the barrel. And that's, uh, you'll see on Locals when I start posting some of the documents from Mexico City. Speaking of that, also, I put a post on Locals. I started a mind map for the Alec oh, Baldwin yeah. Rusta yeah. tragedy. And I've yeah. got some stuff on there already that's really good, I think. Yeah, that's insane. A lot that more to go. crazy, bro. And I'm thinking, I'll run it by Mark. He can turn me down flat. But it, we may do one for Sirhan Sirhan. Because there's so many characters and so many spidery things going out of it, it might be worth doing. Well, we could definitely do it for Oswald because that has oh, a lot definitely of characters. Oswald. Yeah, there's yeah. not as many in Sirhan as there are in Oswald. Oswald's got dozens of characters, and I and I, I could connect them, you know, right. because they become various handlers. It would make more sense for the Oswald story than for Sirhan, to be honest with you. Which, well, we have Oswald coming up, and maybe that'll be part of the release. But yeah, like each guy, uh, each time we do a character analysis, we can add them to the map. You know what I mean? Like where sure. does Tippet fit, fit in? Where does Ruby fit in? Where do you know? We can mm -hmm. add them the tentacles and and spread it out. Ruth Payne, we're going to do uh, Michael Payne and um, George Demorn Schilt and his wife. Don't forget those two lovely people. So we'll, we'll look at doing that, and we may be recruiting some help from locals, you know, our donated community to help us flesh it out or do some basic things, research, troubleshooting, things like that, because it, it is um, quite a bit of work, but I think I think you all, you, everyone will enjoy it. Right. So consider it on structure.locals.com. Consider Otherwise, it. Yeah, I mean, go to your rabbi, go to your minister, see if they can back you up on this <laughs> virtually. Consult I mean, your doctor. Consult your doctor, consult your spiritual doctor. Um, yeah, I mean, you could subscribe for free, right, Eric? Um, su subscriptions are always free and more than welcome. It really You've does have a lot of subscribers lately. I, I don't know what's going on, but it is exciting to see it grow. Yeah, let's see, uh, folks, let's see if we can get to 12,000 at the end of the year. I mean, we yeah, wanted 10,000, but now we're greedy. We're like, oh, wait a no, minute. Yeah, now we're addicted. Now it's like crack cocaine. Yeah, it's like, now okay, we're, we're almost to 11. So we're just going to keep moving the goalposts. The rat <laughs> so is, like, you know, I'm like the rat on the wheel trying to get that pellet at this point, you know. <laughs> By the way, you could PayPal me if you want the uh, get involved in the book promotion fund and uh, paying oh, for no. coffee. Um, I hope that's not oh, true. Oh, that's been twice that's happened in the past couple of weeks. I hope it's not true. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, he I has think Cloris Leachman died today. So. Uh, there may be one more celebrity coming. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's the season. So people do go in the winter uh, more often than not. Yeah, I'll, I'll find out because he has. Um... No, I don't know if he's dead yet or not. But there that's, was a rumor two weeks ago. I mean, it's, you know. Yeah, that, they, they do that sometimes. I mean, I know. like William Shatner probably have his name thrown out there a few times. So. Well, you can follow me on Twitter at uh, Lord Buckley, yep. uh, B-C-K-L-Y. There's a lot of stuff going on there. Everything's in the description. So I mean, there's a potpourri of links Where, down places. there, like over there down below, you know, okay. as you're passing and hitting the subscribe button, you keep floating down, you make a left, you take the, the right. BQE, you get off Kiwanis and mm -hmm. uh, you hit the thumb, find. you hit the, the red button, hit the thumb, and then you just keep scrolling down and anything you guys want to see a link to locals, everything else. I hope you guys do make it. And to close out, huh. let's right. give a little bit of, um, Oh. A very brief thank you to the guy yes. who made the song yes. and their whole career possible. Yes, yeah, I, I, I forgot about that. Close. This is where I Want Candy comes from. And you want to talk about cultural appropriation. We got to blow the whistle on these guys because when you see the real man doing the real song, play it loud, my friends. Play it loud and be proud. Watch the technique of Bo Diddley! Thank you.